All right, welcome everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started today. Welcome to our session titled Toxic Testing Approach to Learning. I'm now going to turn the time over to our presenter, Lynn White, and let her introduce herself. All right, well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. I am Lynn White, and this is the session on toxic testing. And I actually, I have to start with a confession, uh, because if you read my little intro that I typed up uh, to, you know, for the program, it said that I have completely abandoned testing in three of the four classes that I teach. And that is absolutely true pre-pandemic. Now that I'm teaching from home, I've had to record my lectures, so I've pre-recorded them. And I do have students take quizzes just so that I know that they're actually watching the recordings. And so uh, these recordings, these quizzes rather, are open media. They can take them at the same time. And the plan is that when I do go back to the classroom and knock on wood, that's gonna be really, really soon, um, we're gonna abandon those uh, quizzes altogether. So before I put up my plan for today, I just wanna show you so that you know that I actually do what I say that I'm doing. Um, this is my health psychology class. And you can see that I do have quizzes now, but uh, those will be replaced. And so actually this semester, I've got 70% uh, of the um, assessments, the graded assessments are not related to any type of quiz or test whatsoever. Um, and again, uh, there's 30% here, but that will disappear after the pandemic. Um, and then this is another class I teach, stress and pain. I know I get all the fun stuff. Uh, and once again, uh, I do have some quizzes, uh, but that'll again disappear. And then everything else that I do is not test or quiz related. So in this class, it's 65% that's not test or quiz related this semester. Okay, so. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the plan. Um, I'm going to take the first 15 minutes to just give you an overview of toxic testing, um, you know, how I define it and why it's good or not good. I'm going to go through my process of creating some, some test alternatives and then describe an example of a non-toxic alternative. And then um, that'll leave us with 15 minutes for Q&A and I'm gonna have like a guided activity. So if you've got something you can write with, uh, you know, a laptop or pen and paper, uh, but just something because at the end, I'd like us to share some ideas uh, that we've come up with, okay? So I know Robbie's gonna be um, monitoring the uh, chat. Uh, I'm really bad at keeping track of chats and what I'm saying and everything. So we're going to uh, address any questions you have at the Q&A, if that's OK with you guys. All right, so uh, first of all, what is toxic testing? I bet some of you already have an idea of what I'm going to say here, but it's basically uh, testing for facts, facts, and more facts. That is their memory for facts. I think we got in the habit of doing this because it is really quick and easy to come up with an exam that just and only tests facts and not what students can do with those facts. Um, and it also really, it, it satisfies the stakeholders, but it leaves very little in terms of what we're doing for student development and growth. Uh, in fact, I bet if you were to meet up with one of your students five years from now, and say, what do you remember from my class? Uh, they're likely to, you know, uh, you're, you are likely to get met with a blank stare. Uh, in fact, I don't even think you need to wait five years, wait five weeks at the end of the semester, uh, you know, five weeks after, ask a student, what do you remember, same blank stare. Uh, and that happens in classes, I think, when we are just testing, uh, teaching facts and testing for facts. And so that's what I define as toxic testing. So I just wanna make a couple of key points about toxic testing before we look at some alternative here, alternatives. So number one, our world and its problems have evolved, but our assessment strategies have not. Toxic testing is not training students to be creative, innovative, analytical, and solution-focused thinkers and doers. And 
I want to put emphasis on the doer part. And speaking of which, I think we can do better. Now, at some point in our history, it was probably very um, necessary, required for students to learn a lot of facts and retain those facts. But very arguably, the world is very different today. And that type of engagement and that type of requirement probably isn't as necessary. So number one, our, our tools have changed. If you can remember this, if you know what this is, then um, you'll be, you know, you'll relate to this. Where trying to look up facts was no small task. It was very time consuming, very laborious. It was a lot easier, I think, to remember facts than to have to look them up again. But of course, that's been replaced with this newfound technology that allows us access to pretty much an infinite number of facts within seconds, few mouse clicks, you know, fast thumb typing, and, you know, up it pops. Now, we do have to teach uh, and train students to recognize credible information and sources from non-credible, but the information is there literally within seconds. The challenges have also changed. In the past, we may have presented ourselves with problems or challenges, uh, like how do we build taller? But now we're faced with challenges, how can we build better? And the scope of the problems have changed as well. I think, at, you know, looking back, it seemed like when we were faced with a problem, it was really at a community level or maybe just, you know, uh, looking at the city in which the community resides. But now our problems have reached these global, um, uh, not perspectives, but uh, uh, they're on a global scope, a global scale. And they're very critical problems that we're having to deal with. Now ask yourselves, if we're only, only teaching our students facts and nothing else, are they going to be in a position to help solve these problems? And I think we would say, well, no, of course not. They're not going to be able to do this. But what, many of, what are many of us still doing? Well, we're teaching facts, and then we're quizzing and testing on those facts to make sure that the students remember the facts. Again, I think we need to move away from this. And, and I know that there are people watching who have moved away. Uh, and I know there's probably some people watching who maybe are thinking, hmm, well, that's pretty much what most of my tests are. But again, later we're going to go through an exercise that I think will help you to at least start thinking about some alternatives for your class. All right, so do we really need to stop teaching facts and throw out all quizzes and tests? And I think the answer is no. There are some um, disciplines, some topics, some areas where knowing the facts is extremely important. You can't move on if you don't remember these facts, but it's the what, when, how, and why that are important when it comes to, you know, what facts do I teach? How do I uh, assess those facts? So testing should be a means to an end and not the end itself. Now, I don't know if any of you have read this book. It's called Creating Wicked Students by Paul, and I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. I think it's Hanstead. But anyways, uh, he defines wicked students as those people who can solve wicked problems. So wicked problems are those where the variables that are creating the problem are constantly changing. And therefore, the solutions to those problems also need to consist, uh, constantly change and evolve. And so uh, he basically says that uh, unless we're creating wicked students, we're not going to be able to solve the wicked problems. And unfortunately, most of the problems, the real significant problems that we're faced with right now fall into that category. Now, many decades ago, we probably were very satisfied if we could say, we are graduating competent and effective, excuse me, effective employees. And then I think we moved away from that and said, no, 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 they gotta be outstanding employees. That's who we need to graduate. And then more recently we're saying, no, that's not right either. We want them to be the managers. 
but I bet you can think of people who are in a managerial position and you would not call them wicked, all right? And so uh, in his book, uh, Paul indicates that what we really want is we wanna be graduating wicked students who will then become the wicked leaders and shakers, the movers and doers in our um, society. So remember then, wicked students solve wicked problems. So we have to train students in such a way and engage them in such a way that they are going to become wicked. All right, so I know that probably most, if not all of you are very familiar with Bloom's taxonomy. And so I'm just going to say a couple words about this just in case somebody needs a quick re refresher. But basically, this is a way of conceptualizing uh, learning outcomes, uh, learning goals, and the pyramid is set up in such a way that the learning outcomes and goals that require very little in the way of higher order cognitive thinking are at these lowest rungs. And as you move up through the pyramid, those at the top require the most higher order uh, cognitive skills and thinking. Now, unfortunately, I think most of our tests, uh, especially you know, those toxic tests fall in this category where all we're asking students to do is remember the facts that we're teaching them. And then there are some tests that can tap into understanding very readily, but they are fewer in number. In fact, I think that as we move up the pyramid, what we're doing is we're seeing fewer and fewer tests or individual types of test questions that can address these um, activities, skill sets, et cetera. And so uh, in his book, uh, and like many others, we're concerned about the goals, the learning goals, because again, um, unless they are challenging students to become these wicked students that can solve the wicked problems, then the assessments that we give, which we always try and align with our goals, aren't going to be wicked enough. And so we need to pay attention both to the uh, assessments and the goals at the same time. All right, so I believe that every course should have at least one learning goal that is wicked. And it should take this form. Students will be able to do and then something wicked. Now, you have to put in its place, instead of saying something wicked, you have to define what that is, right? So you have to come up with your own uh, wicked learning goal. And I'm gonna show you some ways that we might be able to do that. All right, so as a health psychologist, I'm, what I'm gonna do now is I, I'm gonna go through that thought process, okay? How do I come up with a, a wicked assessment and a wicked learning goal? And so as a health psychologist, the first step is I, I step back and I think, okay, what, what are some of the challenges that are faced by health psychologists or the discipline? So these can be challenges, they can be long standing debates, problems, whatever, but I'm gonna focus in on my own discipline, health psychology. And for this demonstration, I, I said, okay, well, one of the big challenges we have is how do we get people to engage in preventative healthcare behaviors. Now, this is really relevant uh, today because of where we are, what we're doing, what we're living through. So it's something that I think is gonna to appeal to a lot of students. So how do we get people to engage in preventative health behavior? The next thing I have to do is think, okay, well, what skills do I need to have in order to address this problem? Because ultimately, if I'm going to be graduating students who are either going to become consumers of health information or health psychologists themselves, they need to be able to do things like this, but maybe on a, a, a lower scale, but they still need be, to be able to do this. So I have to sit down and I write down all the things that I need to be able to do. So I have to be able to identify a preventable health condition, of which there are many. I need to identify behaviors that will either increase or decrease the risk for that condition. I need to bring in my own previous knowledge, so the facts that I can remember. Uh, so facts are important, so bring those in, search for new facts, new information, 
to identify any uh, variables that uh, play into the risk level or the behavior related to the condition, anything that is relevant here. And then of course the wicked, the really wicked part is I need to think creative, creatively and analytically to propose a solution, okay? Now, once I've done this, so once I've identified this is a problem that needs to be tackled within our discipline, these are the skills that I need to have in order to tackle that question, I actually now have arrived at a learning goal, all right? And so the learning goal is students, successful students will be able to identify challenges, right? That's up here, faced by health psychologists and come up with possible solutions. So um, to reach this goal, I went through this thought process, but I have my goal. I still don't have the specifics of the assessment, all right? Have, I'm, I'm starting to develop it, but I don't yet have the final product. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna show you how I went from here, now that I've got this learning goal, how did I get to the assessment? Okay, so what I've done is I've kind of broken this up into four uh, stages, all right? The first thing I do is I think I, I need to have an activity that I can do with the class to introduce the concept of preventative healthcare behavior, because that's, that's that's gonna introduce the challenge, okay? And so what I've done um, in, in with my classes, I talk about mask wearing. I always try and pick something relevant to what's going on today. So we talk about mask wearing, but I introduce the concept of a theory in health psychology called the health belief model. And just really, really quick, what it says basically is that we will engage in a health behavior if we feel that that um, behavior, if we don't engage in it, we're at serious risk, all right? And so what I have the students do is, uh, well, when we're together in the classroom, they all get together and they look at the different aspects of the model and um, try and predict, so each person tries to predict whether somebody else will or will not wear a mask based on what the health belief model says. Okay, so that's step one is get them involved in an activity related to the challenge that you're introducing. The next part, now this is where students move away and work on their own. So this next part is they're required to bring in concepts, bring in facts, findings, theories that they have learned throughout the course related to this activity that we just performed. And so they may bring in, for example, the role of perceptions, uh, previous experience with illness, social norms, uh, but they need to show that they can actually integrate pr uh, prior information. Then this now starts to move into the wicked zone. Then they have to start thinking, okay, apart from mask wearing, uh, what are some other challenges, uh, you know, faced, for example, uh, during the pandemic, things that we might struggle with uh, it can be related to fast uh, uh, mask wearing, but it can be something else. So let's say somebody wants to talk about the vaccine and how, um, you know, with what was going on this summer, we've identified a lot of social inequities and not everybody's gonna have access to the vaccine. So they've identified at this point, something else that is relevant to the original activity and to the original challenge that we're being faced with. And then the real wicked part is I have them identify plausible solutions. Now, I say plausible. So they can't, for example, say, I'm going to get in a plane and I'm going to drop vials of vaccine over every square inch of this planet. And that way everybody will have the vaccine because that's not plausible. Uh, nor do we ever expect them to solve the issue that none of us have been able to solve but they have to at least make an attempt at finding some sort of a solution that might work. They don't have to carry it out. So they might say, I'm gonna pay uh, community leaders and they are gonna go to you know, house to house, door to door, finding out how they can help the residents, what questions they have, um, what uh, uh, physical needs they might have so that everybody can get the vaccine. Now, 
now I have my, my um, assessment, my wicked assessment to go with my wicked goal. Now, just about everybody can get through that first part where all they have to do is bring in related concepts. So that's the easy part. And pretty much everybody is gonna get to this next level too, where they identify a relevant related social issue. So these issues go kind of hand in hand. They're, they're certainly connected. And then the A category, well, this is where you're gonna get a lot of student complaints because this is where they're saying, uh, you know, this is too hard. Uh, I can't think of anything. You shouldn't make it so difficult for me to get an A, et cetera. Uh, then you'll have other students who'll be like, oh my gosh, thank you for pushing me. This is awesome. Uh, but regardless, we have to push this hard if we really want our students to be wicked. All right. Okay, so this is where I'm going to pause before we actually try this ourselves. Um, so if uh, there are any questions, this would be a really good time maybe for you to ask questions. I don't, uh, I don't know if there's any chats, so I can't, I can see. Nope. Nope. All right, so no, uh, hold on a second. Don't have, okay, good. All right, so um, what I would like you to do, again, if you have something maybe that you can write with, that would be awesome. Um, Hold on, my slide froze here. Okay, so first, first of all, step number one, write down a course, something that you teach. And it doesn't, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily have to be your favorite or just something that you want to tweak a little bit. Okay. All right. Take a few more minutes here and identify present, uh, you know, important day challenges faced by your discipline. These can be longstanding debates, maybe. Nature versus nurture, I don't know. Okay, do you think of a, a couple here? All right. So look at uh, what you've come up with and then think of, um, you know, of those, think of the one that you think your students will uh, find the most interesting, the most appealing, usually I try and think, you know, well, what's going on in the world around me today? Uh, and if I get stuck, I, I ask my, uh, my kids who are all young adults and they sometimes give me some insight. Okay, hopefully you've got one. All right. Uh, now, write down a list of um, skills that you, you know, as a professional, what would you need to be able to do for you to start addressing this problem? All right, so addressing this challenge, this debate, this whatever. Now, there's going to be, um, I'm sure, skills at the micro and macro level. Right now, just work on macro level skills. Later, you can fill in the micro level. And the ones, by the way, that I showed in the previous slides, those skills I consider to be macro level skills. Micro level skills would be like, for example, do they know how to do um, online search for peer reviewed journal articles, for example? Okay. 
will we get the slide stack? I'm sure there is uh, a way that uh, that we can do that. Uh, Robbie, Robbie, I think, right? Are you listening? I'm here. Is uh, can they get the the slides? Is there a way to get people the slides from this presentation? Um. Sure, I'm sure if you send them to Travis or anyone, we get they can't from Zoom, but they're these are recorded, so they can watch them. Um, and I'm sure we could figure out a way to get them to people. Okay. Well, and the other thing is on the very last slide, uh, I have my um, oh, I don't have my contact. I'll put it in the chat, my email, and you can always email me. Uh, you can upload it in the files area in the chat. Okay, do you know how to do that, Robbie? Yeah, that's a good idea too. Can Can you take care of that? Um, you have to do it. I can't do it because you'd have to have the slides and then share it as a file. So there on the chat, you'll see that there's a bottom right next to three little dots. You can click on that, click on the file, and then share it with everyone. Oh, but that's only saving the chat. Oh, it will share a file. See the little. Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, you guys still work on your uh, your skills here. Let me just uh, upload this. Thanks, Mohammed, for that. Okay, sorry guys. Hmm. Oh, that's right, right there, sorry. Okay. Learn something new. Okay, so hopefully you've got your um, your skill set lined up. Uh, now, at this point, I'm usually able to identify a some sort of learning goal. So I don't have it here as number five. Like number five is on the next slide, and it's kind of something a little bit different. So I want to like put in a four B. Okay. So look at your challenge, look at your skill set, and then see if you can write successful students in this class will be able to, and then finish the sentence. See if you've come up with something wicked. Ah, you're welcome. All right, so try that. Look at, look at what you put as your challenge, right? In your, in your discipline, look at the skill sets. Successful students will be able to, and then find a way of summarizing those skills. Okay, so your skill sets, successful students will be able to perform these skills to, and then state the problem, right? To identify ways of changing preventive, you know, um, preventative health behaviors or whatever. Okay, so you should have something that, that's uh, very close to the goal that you want. All right, so the next step. Okay, so now we've got to figure out, do the students have all the little micro level skills that they'll need to carry out those macro level skills. Now this is gonna take some time, so we're not gonna have time to go through all that now, okay? But just do they have them? And then, and then you're gonna to have to figure out a plan to teach those micro level skills if they don't have them. And that's where you can have a series of activities that build up to the final project. The sixth then, so that's the sixth step, is to develop a plan. Again, you can have like miniature activities 
building up to the final product. And then the real tricky part, the one that's hardest is identify an activity or project that requires them to use the macro level skills to solve or propose a solution to the problem. So this is where, you know, it's, it's helpful to, you know, engage the class together, if at all possible, especially if you're in a classroom, get them to use the skills that you have just identified on the previous slide, the macro level skills. Um, and, and the end goal though, is that not only are they gonna have to use these skills, they're using it for a real meaningful purpose that we consider wicked you know, which is solving a wicked problem. And so this is the point where, again, it, you know, this is very discipline specific, topic specific, but remember what you're trying to do is get them to actually propose a solution to the problem that they've been identified, uh, that you've ident helped them to identify. Now, let me just say, okay, so you should now have, <laughs> wicked goals and, and, and some sort of an idea for an assessment. Oh, I thought I had something in the chat. Okay, so uh, I wanna tell you just a little bit about uh, my experience with this. And then maybe we have time, we can share, uh, you know, what you guys have come up with. But uh, it is a little bit of a bumpy ride. I gotta say, it's a lot harder doing this than writing exams, you know, that are multiple choice factual type exams. Uh, it is far more rewarding. I find that the, the good students, they love this. And the students who, who are just like, all I want is, you know, I just wanna get that class and get it, you know, I heard it's easy. Well, it's, you know, not, not now, it's not easy, all right? so. It is gonna be the case that students will find this difficult, especially that last step when they're proposing a solution, all right? They're not all gonna get there, um, especially with the early activities and the early ass assignments. So I tend to weight those a lot lower than I do assignments later on in the semester when now they've uh, had a little bit more training and experience. Nevertheless, <laughs> Be prepared, students, some students, they just don't, you know, they, you try as much as you can to show value added and everything, um, but you will get some backlash, at least that's been my experience. And some of us will complain too, because again, I've, you know, every semester when it comes to grading finals and everything, you know, final projects, I keep banging my head against the wall going, why did I do that? But then I remind myself how rewarding this is. And not every goal or assessment needs to be wicked. And so uh, I started off with just a couple in every class and um, it's grown since then, but I don't have this for every assessment because it is hard for some students and I don't want them to get very, you know, too discouraged if they can't reach that last level, that's okay. You know, uh, they may not just be prepared for that yet. And, and I don't want them to feel uh, somehow inferior because they couldn't think of anything, any solutions. Um, I have my own website where I put everything for my classes on this website. Um, SEU doesn't allow us to have faculty uh, websites within their, their, uh, their server, uh, but we can have outside resources. And so I've put everything for my classes here and you're more than welcome to look around get ideas of some of these assessments. Some of them are assessments in the making, so you don't see the most current version um, that will go up in the summer and then the fall. But um, yeah, does, uh, what time does this end again? I'm sorry. Robbie? Well, I'm, I'm guessing we're getting close to the end. One minute left, sorry. One minute. Does anybody want to share me share with us oh, maybe a uh, wicked goal or a wicked assessment that you might have thought about? I know it's we haven't given you much time to do this, but I just had a quick question about um, how hard or easy is it when you get there when they propose a solution, and 
maybe some of them are, you know, what, what makes it plausible, I guess, how hard is that to make that argument to them where you'll have to tell them that this isn't plausible or that doesn't work? So uh, the, the rule is if somebody could do it, not whether you could do it, you know, maybe you don't have, you know, don't have the technology, don't have the, um, uh, the money, the connections, that's not important. It's whether somebody else could. Uh, and, and that seems to be a, a guideline that, you know, uh, they understand and works well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So actually, I teach in computing and IT, and this is type of the model we use in terms of uh, providing situations where they can write an application solving a real world problem. Oh. than just, you know, assessing. Uh, sometimes we have to have the facts. They have to do some quizzes so they can check. But then they will come with a solution. And then we share the solutions with students. So they will go in and talk about the benefits. Why my solution is better compared to the other students. And at that point, it becomes a, a good learning experience for them. Uh, so in some fields, that is a better approach to make them understand the skill. Now, I, I teach also uh, ethical hacking. So we teach penetration testing, all the stuff that people get scared and hear about every day. And these, the tool sets change per day. I mean, I can show them a, a, an application that, you know, I have a video or a couple of things showing them how it's working. And then the next day it changes. And that is, that's a, I, I, some students get upset with that, but I try to make it to make them understand this is they are really doing a real life learning and experience in the class. They are adapting and learning the skills that they will use in the future. So again, you know, this is a, a wonderful skill set as faculty or teachers. We need to learn how we go in and put things in a more um, a measurable way. And that helps us even to measure and assess them for accreditation at some point. Yeah, well, it's it's you know what I like about that is that you're you're basically training students to do what they will need to do after graduation. Uh, exactly. And, yeah, but oftentimes I think we have students do things in class that we don't do. Uh, we do we ever sit down and memorize facts to use it in our day to day activities? You know, so why are we having our students do that? I mean, not again, some facts are absolutely essential to know, but um, <clears throat> I think there's too much reliance on, you know, got to push the facts, push the facts. Remember, remember, remember. It's uh, doing is really important. Yeah, and, and we tell them there is, there is nothing called a, an ultimate solution. It's, you know, people will have, in the software, people will have different ways of thinking about reaching the solution. So right. there is no sequence of steps that they have to go in and follow each time exactly. Yes. Well, that sounds like, I mean, especially in your uh, discipline. Oh, that was supposed to say, thank you, everybody, not thank you, everything. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but it does sound like you've got a very wicked um, discipline. The problems there and the solutions are always changing. So that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I, I think we might be uh, close to being out of time or out of time. A any other quick questions that I might be able to answer? No? Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate uh, you coming to this session. And um, I hope that uh, it's helpful for you. All right. Thank you so much, Lynn. I put a feedback link in okay. the chat so you can give feedback today's session. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Bye. Bye. Everyone have a great day. You too.